Wow. <laughs> uh, my name is Harvard Ayers, and uh, you've seen me up here before in just a very brief uh, cameo. But my next uh, pleasure, I should say, is to introduce, I think, one of the most important persons in the whole climate change movement. And this is an engineer at Stanford, and his name is Dr. Mark Z. Jacobson. And Dr. Jacobson and his friends at Stanford and one guy, DeLucci, over at uh, UC Berkeley, have done a several year process of figuring out how the best strategy is to get away from fossil fuels. So anyhow, here's what the introduction says. Mark Jacobson is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. Mark is director of the Atmosphere Energy Program and senior fellow of the Woods Institute for Environment. His career has focused on better understanding air pollution and global warming problems and developing large-scale clean renewable energy solutions to them. Toward that end, he has developed and applied three-dimensional atmospheric biosphere ocean computer models and solves, uh, solvers to uh, simulate air pollution, weather, climate, and renewable energy. He has also developed roadmaps to transition states and countries to 100% clean renewable energy for all purposes and computer models to examine grid stability in the presence of high penetrations of renewable energy. He has developed a plan for each individually of each of the 50 states, and this is what I'm going to be talking to you about later today. So Jacobson, Dr. Jacobson is my hero, and now I introduce to you Dr. Mark Jacobson. Thank you very much, Harvard. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, trying to transition states and countries to 100% renewable energy for all purposes. Um, next slide, please. And for all purposes is electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, and industry. And the idea is to uh, first electrify everything and then provide that electricity with clean renewable energy. So for example, in transportation, we use battery electric vehicles, some hydrogen fuel cell, battery electric fiber for long distance ships, trucks, aircraft, airplanes. Uh, for heating and cooling, we use heat pumps for air conditioning and air heating, and also for water heating. Uh, some solar hot water preheating. Uh, we use induction cooktop stoves instead of gas stoves. Uh, for industry, instead of uh, gas, oil, high temperature processes, we use electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, dielectric heating. Uh, and then we provide all that electricity with wind, water, and solar. So solar thermal tanks on rooftops, concentrated solar power plants, uh, geothermal power, hydroelectric power, tidal power, wind power. These are all clean renewable energy sources. Uh, next slide, please. The, we need some storage because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. So for electricity, we use concentrated solar power with storage, uh, pump hydroelectric power, where you have two reservoirs, a lower one and an upper one, and you have excess electricity from water up the hill. When you have two, when you need the electricity, you let the water drain down and help run a turbine. Uh, and we use existing hydroelectric power in reservoirs for heating as well. That's a form of storage. It's reservoirs are like a big battery. You can uh, discharge water from them and run a turbine to generate electricity instantaneously. We're not talking about growing our, uh, uh, hydroelectric power, just using existing hydro more efficiently. And then, of course, our batteries, which are the most expensive of all these technologies right now, but we can do it on a small scale. For heating and cooling, we would, use, we would store our heat and cold in water, ice, and rock. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. We'd also use hydrogen as a form of storage and we also try to balance match power demand with supply with a, something called demand response, where you sell these uh, get incentive to customers to use power at certain times of the day, not to use power at certain times of the day. 
Next slide, please. I want to give you an example of different types of key cold storage that you may or may not be aware of. So my university has had under a big building, uh, has done ice cube since 1998. So almost 20 years. And so at night, when electricity prices are low, the electricity is used to produce ice. And then during the daytime, uh, when you need electricity for air conditioning in the afternoon, instead of using electricity, you run water through coils in the ice, like in this example, and that water is then cooled and then sent to buildings and used to cool a building. That avoids afternoon electricity demand. So this is a form of electricity storage itself. But it's really expensive compared to batteries. One tenth the cost of battery. Next slide, please. Um, another example is uh, storage. So our university is also used to have a gas for generation plant that provided 80% of the electricity and the heat for the university. And that was bulldozed and removed about a year ago and replaced with these two boilers and a chiller. The two, two big tanks contain hot water and the smaller tank contains cold water. And now at different times of the year, or any, any given day of the year, the university needs both hot and cold water. So instead of, uh, well, whenever you produce heat, then you release cold. And whenever you produce cold, you release heat. So usually that excess cold or heat that's produced is wasted. But if you actually capture that and send it back to the, the hot water and cold water tanks, you can store that energy and use it in different parts of the university at the same time and save a lot of energy. Now, this is that our university replaced the gas plant with the two boilers and chillers plus a bunch of solar and photovoltaics in the desert. And now it's eliminated 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions and provides that same energy uh, pollution free. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another example of storm storage. Uh, this is a community in Okotoks, Canada, one hour south of Calgary. And so in the summer, when the days are long, uh, you can see there are 52 homes and they have solar collectors on their the roofs of their garages. Uh, sunlight comes down to the collectors, heats a light bulb solution. That solution is then transferred by pipes to this building on the right, where the heat is then transferred to water. The water then gets transferred underground by pipes uh, where into this field. Under this field, it was excavated and filled with rocks. The heat from the water heats the rocks up to 80 degrees Celsius, and that heat is stored until winter time. In winter time, the whole system is run in reverse, and that heat stored in the rocks provides 100% for these 52 homes where there's snow on the ground is the bottom of the coat. So this is called seasonal heat storage. Uh, next slide. Now, one more type of storage I'm going to mention is batteries. Uh, everybody can participate in the solution to air pollution and global warming and energy security by electrifying their own home and eliminating all sorts of uses of gas in the home or coal or oil. So for example, uh, here are four Tesla batteries that are used to power uh, a home. And so you can, you can electrify your home by putting, for example, solar on your roof, uh, then batteries in the garage to collect that electricity and use it judiciously and send it back to the grid where needed. And then eliminate all other gas use in your home by getting, using heat air source heat pumps for air heating and air conditioning, which run on electricity, use the heat pumps for water heating as well, and get a, an induction cooktop stove to eliminate gas use in your stove, and then get electric cars, replace gas, gasoline cars with electric cars that can be powered with this uh, battery electricity or the solar directly from the rooftop. Even though it looks complicated, it's actually pretty straightforward, and people are consulting it can help in implementing this. And over, over time, you save money, definitely, with this type of system. Although, you know, it's real complicated setting up at first, and there's no front cost, it pays itself bought back over time. But you eliminate all the use of gas, coal, oil in your home, and in your transportation. Uh, next slide, please. So, you might ask, well, why don't we use nuclear power? Uh, so if we're focusing on wind, water, and solar. Uh, first, Nuclear power does not eliminate all air pollution. It's about 6 to 24 times more carbon dioxide emissions and air pollution per unit energy generated than, for example, wind power. 
And the reason is because you have to mine and refine uranium throughout the lifetime of a nuclear power plant. And uranium is a very energy intensive process to refine. So that's about half the industry. The other half is due to the fact that it takes between 10 and 19 years between planning and operation of a nuclear plant versus two to five years for a solar or wind farm. And that's not only the construction time, that's the siting time, the permit site permit time, the construction permit, the issue time, and the construction time. And so while you're waiting around for your nuclear plant to be put up, then uh, you're emitting background or you're emitting carbon dioxide and air pollution from the background grid, which is primarily coal and oil, to gas, and primarily coal to gas for electricity. Well, not only that, the nuclear power plants today cost three to four times that of uh, onshore wind or utility scale photovoltaic farm uh, for human energy generated. So it takes two to ten times longer to obtain about one third to one fourth the carbon dioxide savings per dollar than for wind or solar with nuclear. And that's that's just the economic reason. But there's also there's also security issues. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, says there is robust evidence of high agreement that the increased use of nuclear power will lead to more weapons proliferation risk, meltdown risk, waste risk, and mining risk. So that's the reason why we do not choose nuclear. Not because it's not better in some respects than fossil fuel, but it's not so good as clean renewable energy. Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, proposal I think to use what's called clean coal, coal with carbon capture. But this is not clean. In fact, it's dirtier than regular coal, and I'll show you why. Well, first of all, we have what's called clean coal. We reduce 85 to 90 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions from the smokestack from a coal-fired power plant. Well, that part's good. But we don't reduce any of the emissions from the mining or transporting of the coal. In fact, all those emissions go up 25 percent because you need 25 percent more coal to run the carbon capture work. And the coal does not, the clean coal does not reduce any of the other pollutants aside from carbon dioxide, so they all go up 25 percent. So there's higher, more hydrocarbons, more particulate matter, more oxides of nitrogen, more sulfur oxides. So you have, you have more air pollution, and in the United States, about 60 to 65,000 people died prematurely from air pollution, and maybe one third of those are from coal fired power plants. You actually increase air pollution associated with uh, coal, even though you decrease, decrease slightly the CO2. Well, I say slightly, you decrease about 50% to 60% of CO2, but you still have 50 times more CO2 per unit energy than wind power. Um, next slide, please. So let's just see. Is it possible then to power the entire world with clean, renewable wind, water, and solar power for all purposes? So I'll look at some numbers here. In 2012, the world end use power demand was 12.1 terawatts, or trillion watts. The, and if you go to 2015 with population growth and energy growth projections, we go to 20.6 terawatts by 2050. However, if you electrify everything, provided electricity with clean, renewable, wind, water, and solar, we would decrease our power demand 42.5% to 11.8 terawatts. And that's not without changing our habits. And that, that can be broken down into 22% due to the fact that electricity is more efficient than combustion. So in other words, an electric car, for example, uh, 80 to 86% of the electricity that goes into the car goes into the car goes to move the car and the rest is waste heat. With a gasoline car, only 17 to 20 percent of the, like, the energy in the gasoline goes to move the car and the rest is waste heat. So by electrifying the car, you reduce energy use a factor of four to five. And the result of that is that the cost of driving an electric car is about eight cents per gallon equivalent, versus gasoline, which is anywhere from two to four dollars a gallon. So, you know, if you drive an electric car, for 15 years at 15,000 miles per year, you will save on the order of 15 to 20,000 dollars in fuel costs. So even if you like the car costs more expensive to buy, you definitely save money over the long term by uh, reduction in fuel costs. Well, so electric electric cars actually get most of the efficiency benefits of electrification. Um, other sectors cost so much, but we average over all sectors it's about 23 percent reduction. 
then you save 12.6% of energy worldwide because you have no longer need to spend energy to mine, transport, or refine fossil fuels. So then you can get another 6.9% energy efficiency improvement beyond what's expected in the business as usual case for a total of 42.5 percent demand reduction when you electrify with wind water and solar. So next slide please. So we did energy plans for all 50 US states and 139 countries and this slide shows the summary of all the devices you would need to power the entire country for all these 139 countries which represents more than 99 percent of all emissions worldwide. You would, and so this is how you provide that power. 23.5% with onshore wind, 13.6% uh, with offshore wind, about 16% with residential rooftop photovoltaics, 12% with commercial government rooftop photovoltaics, about 20% solar photovoltaic power plants, about 10% concentrated solar power plants, about less than 1% geothermal, 4% hydroelectric, this is all existing, that's why the number on the right is zero, that's the number of new devices you need. And then a tiny amount of tidal and wave power. So you might ask, well, this is a lot of area, and I'll show you in a second. But first I want to show you where you get, what our plan is for North Carolina. Uh, first of all, I should mention that uh, we've been developing these energy plans at Stanford and at UC Berkeley and some other institutions, and then we started, I started a non-profit along with three other people, including um, actor Mark Ruffalo and uh, film director Josh Fox and a business person Mark O'Critical, but now it's expanded to lots of people. This uh, non-profit is called the Solutions Project, and you can find it at thesolutionsproject.org. And there's a subgroup called 100.org. And they basically take our energy plans and try to educate the public and policy makers about them. So if you go on our website, you can find immediately a map of the United States. There's also a link to a, a national map of the world. With the US map, you can click on a state. And when you click on North Carolina, this is what you get. This is the top part of it. And it shows you basically a summary of our North Carolina energy plan. And without going into the details, it basically says how many, what percent of the total 2050 power would be onshore wind, offshore wind, etc. And we see from each graph, it's you know, on the order of half of all the power would be from solar and half would be from wind, while the offshore wind for North Carolina to power the state 100% wind water solar for all purposes by 2050. And that 39.5%, you can see in the middle of this page, that's the reduction of power demand by electrifying, providing that electricity to renewable energy. It also gives you information about jobs, air pollution reductions and cost of energy. Uh, next slide, please. So back to our world plan. Uh, based on the previous slide, I showed for all the number of devices we need worldwide. This shows the land area required to power the entire world for all purposes, eliminating four to seven million air pollution deaths worldwide each year, and eliminating global warming, providing energy stability for everyone. Um, so this indicates that we need about 0.92% of the world's land for wind turbine spacing. That space between wind turbines that can be used for agriculture, uh, open space, grazing land, farmland. So the green, the green dot on the bottom right, that's the spacing area needed for onshore wind, which can be used for multiple purposes. And that's 0.92% of the world's land. The yellow dot to the left of that is the area needed for utility scale photovoltaics and concentrated solar power, that's about 0.22% of the world's land. Now, the rest of the land, you don't need any hydro land, a uh, very tiny amount of geothermal. Rooftop photovoltaics does not take through land. And then the rest of it's offshore. So we're talking about only 0.22% of the world's land for actual footprint on the ground, and another, another almost 1% for spacing to be power the whole world. And this does not account for what you land you recover from eliminating oil wells, uh, gas wells, coal mines, uh, transport of fuels to pipelines, getting rid of all the pipelines, refineries, getting rid of nuclear power plants, etc., etc. So you do save a lot of land that as well. Next slide, please. Um, so you might ask, 
Do you keep your bread sitting on the twin marks? Because the window is always blown, the sun doesn't always shine. So we, we've done two studies on this, two our major studies. One is we took our 50 state plan and looked at the 48 contiguous states, and we found that if we if we take all the numbers of devices that we predicted that we need for each state, and we then put those the numbers of devices for solar and wind in a climate model that predicts the weather every 30 seconds, we did it for six years. So to give us an intermittent supply of energy, and then we compared that with the demand for energy every 30 seconds for six years, and we calculated how much storage we would need, we found that not only could we uh, match our demand with supply every 30 seconds for six years across the 48 contiguous U.S. states with wind, water, and solar alone, but it was at no cost, too. Now, we did the same thing for our 139 countries, where we broke the 139 countries into 20 rural regions. And this shows uh, the results for several of those regions, where it shows 20 days, every hour, for 20 days, the red line is the energy supply, which is really variable. But the blue is the energy demand plus the changes in storage, plus the losses, plus the shedding of energy. And you notice that the blue dots match the red lines exactly. In fact, they match every every uh, 30 seconds we've done for all four years for all 20 regions. And this shows the results of the US plus Canada as one grid. And what we see is filling that the supply with demand. And this is for not only, this is for the US plus Canada, but we did the same thing for South America, 12 countries. Uh, next slide, this is the next slide here. Uh, then we're going to do this slide pretty rapidly. Next slide, please. Um, in Australia, same thing, we're able to match power demand with supply. Uh, next slide, please. Here's Japan and South Korea, matching power demand with supply. Next slide, please. Here's China, Hong Kong, Mongolia, North Korea, uh, matching power and demand supply. Next slide, please. Uh, here's Russia and Georgia, not, the, not Georgia, the U.S. country Georgia, uh, matching power and demand supply. Uh, next slide, please. Here's India, the Polish uh, Next slide, please. Uh, here's Central Asia. Next, next slide, please. Uh, Middle East, the 16 countries. Uh, next slide, please. Here's Europe. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, more finally, Iceland. This is not finally, I don't want to cut this. Uh, next slide, please. Africa. Again, matching supply with the demand. So we're able to do this. Finally, next slide. Next slide. We're able to do this for all uh, 139 countries, all 20 world regions, match power with the supply. And this is the cost of energy that we found uh, for 139 countries. Uh, wind, water, solar electricity was 9.8 cents per kilowatt hour, which includes uh, the power generation, uh, short and long distance transmission and distribution, electricity heat storage, and providing a stable grid. Now that's for the electric power center, but now compare, compare that with conventional electricity, which is from fossil fuels to the well, the direct cost of conventional electricity is also about 9.8 cents per kilowatt hour, but there's the health cost, which is about 4.7, and the climate cost, which is about 15.8 by 2050. So a total of 38 cents per kilowatt hour for the cost of conventional electricity. So by converting to it, wind, water, solar, we reduce the cost by on the order of the close to 20 cents per, um, well, more, 27 cents per kilowatt hour. 28 cents. Now, the bottom number is the wind, water, solar cost for all energy sectors, because the top one is just for the electricity sector, replacing the electricity sector. All energy is about 10.7 cents per kilowatt hour for the wind, water, and solar. So this is a low cost solution at 100% reliable grid going to the renewable energy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, how long will it take to transition? Well, we're proposing 100% transition, transition by 2050 and 80% by 2030. So if we don't do anything, we go along the top line of this graph. If we electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy, we reduce power demand 
two shades of gray down to the 100 percent line, the red line. And then we're trying to provide that electricity with just wind, water, and solar. And we phase out fossil fuels such that by 2030 we've eliminated 80 percent of the emissions uh, through the methods we talked about earlier. The next slide, please. But so I want us to just summarize everything that we just talked about and on a worldwide scale. And these numbers are similar to the US, but the magnitudes are different. Um, if we electrify everything, provide electricity within 100 percent of water solar, we reduce power demand 42.5%. You're going to brought 44 to 7 million air pollution deaths per year worldwide, including 65,000 in the US. That would save the world about $23 trillion per year. And in the US, it's about $500 billion per year in health costs, which is about 3% of the US GDP. We avoided another $27 trillion per year global climate cost of 2050, which is equivalent to 15.8 cents per kilowatt hour. We give 100% stable grid in all 21 regions at a cost of energy around 10.7 cents per kilowatt hour. All in the next slide, please. We create 24 million more jobs than are lost, including 2 million in the United States. This requires only 2 percent of the world's land for our footprints and 92 percent for spacing. We make countries energy independent and between national conflicts. We create strict power producing terrorism and catastrophic risk. We reduce energy poverty by up to 4 million people worldwide because we can provide energy to work the remote regions for history and solar and wind project. We can't provide right now. Uh, next slide. There are challenges and barriers, including upfront costs and challenges. Because you, wind, water, and solar have higher upfront costs than fossil, the lower fuel costs. So you have you need capital to really change the system, but it pays for itself over time. So you end up paying about the same in terms of direct energy costs as the fossil fuel system. We do have transmission needs for long distance transmission for wind and solar are usually further or far away from where they're needed. And then lobbying and politics are the biggest barriers. Now these are barriers, but they're not, they can be overcome. Uh, cost, the actual cost of energy and the you know, technical or economic uh, barrier to solving the problem are things we have to issues that we have to overcome, but it, there's not a there's no intrinsic reason we can't solve this problem. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, these are some websites uh, where you can find the actual papers uh, on the study that I just talked about. And there are also some other presentations and papers and other information. The infographic maps that I showed you an example of at solutionsproject.org, and also 100 org And then if you're interested in paper updates on Twitter as well. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer the questions at the end of the time. Thank you. Mark, I have a question myself for you. Can you show us your smile and face or is it, or is it the slideshow is going to be where it is? So can, can you come on there personally? Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Let's not lose him. <laughs> Let's not lose him well enough. Okay, I'll get an idea of what Mark looks like. There he is in the flesh. Okay, we're going to ask you a couple of questions now. We have time for a couple. Is that okay, Mark? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, sir. You have a question right here. Yeah, it's sort of a technical question. Um, you were comparing uh, wind and solar with nuclear, for example, um, and, and you said one of the issues with nuclear is you have to mine the uranium, et cetera. Um, when you were making that comparison, were you comparing uh, the energy it takes to produce the wind and solar, including mining those products? Yes, yeah, so the, the energy, the carbon emissions, for both of them were accounted for the for the energy required to mine and, and produce the solar panels, well, in this case, we're just looking at wind. We produce the wind, wind turbines, 
It takes a, let's say a wind turbine can last 30 years for an onshore wind turbine. And the energy required to build the turbine is about six months, four to six months of the output of the turbine. So if the turbine is running for 30 years, for the first four to six months, it's repaying back the energy it took to, to, to build the turbine and also to decommission it in its lifetime. So you know, four to six months out of 30 years is on the order of 98, 99% carbon free. So it is one to 2% carbon emission. And that translates to about uh, 10 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of wind generated. Whereas the nuclear plant, if you just look at the, the building of the plants plus the mining of the uranium over its lifetime, refining what the refining does in those energy intensive process, that part is around 65 to 70 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. But then there's another around 60 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour from the nuclear plant for the time lag. But the fact that you're running fossil fuel plants while you're waiting for the nuclear plant to be built and to be permitted versus the wind farm. So half of the CO2 emissions from the nuclear is used to waiting around for it, and the other half is from the actual building of the plant and then the uranium mining and refining during the lifetime. Thank you very much, sir. One more, okay, one more, sorry. Have you thought about the, um, I'm sure you have, but what's your take on how you get uh, the invested uh, interest utility company into the electric utilities uh, transition this way? Is there any way to make that in your interest to uh, do that? Yeah, it's very difficult because utilities are very, they don't seem to want to change their business model. And there's some that are progressing, but others that are not. I and mean, some of them are changing. On their own. I think there's in fact a range of different utilities, which ones are like moving more towards renewable energy and which ones aren't. But it takes a lot of arm twisting. And, and, and the real reason was easy. So I think the policy is going to be put in place to force them to change for the most part. Because otherwise they have no incentive to change. You know, but, you know that, uh, we're talking about the cost of new energy, but as long as you tell you that some of them have been left with coal plants that have been grandfathered in under the Clean Air Act amendments, so to run really inexpensively for a long time. And so they have, you know, they made a profit on it, so they, there's no reason for them to change unless the regulations or the policies are put in place to incentivize the transition to new energy, which is better for people's health and the planet. Uh, it's becoming easier because wind and solar are so cheap now that, you know, like sometimes like Iowa, 40% uh, of all the electricity produced in Iowa now is wind. And that does not mean any kind of policy regulation. It's going to use the fact that so is very cheap. The same with the other great United States. Now, North Carolina doesn't have so great of wind resources in, as in the great plains. Uh, so, a place like North Carolina would be. Because it's a little more expensive for the wind than in other places, you know, more incentives to transition are probably needed. Because we're not going to build a transition without both combination, both costs, which are occurring, but policies to put in place to really incentivize the transition. Like if you have a, a, a timeline to say, well, we want to go to 100% by 2050, and we have policy that the renewable standard that says we're going to get 80% by 2030 and 50% by 2025, you know, that will force the transition, force the utilities to change, because they probably won't change on their own otherwise. Exactly. And um, one of the programs in the afternoon is John and Uncle from NC Warren. He's going to be talking about some of the policy challenges. And I'm sorry, y'all, that's all the time we have. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, kind of, you know, the next thing is lunch, and y'all kind of started eating lunch already anyway. One more question for me. I'm just wondering uh, a couple of things. Could I come, your call ever really come back a little, I mean, a little blip? But with gas, we are going to eventually see its price rise. And, you know, we're going to get locked in with these gas plants to much higher prices, at least potentially volatile prices. And you know, with these, with wind and solar going in the right direction, it seems really ought to be able to change the policy. Yeah, well, I agree with you. That's why we have to rise up the climate. But you're also, I mean, 
You're, as I mentioned earlier, 13% of all the energy worldwide is used to mine, transform, and refine fossil fuel. So in the US, there are 20,000 new gas wells every year. Right? And you have to keep putting in 20,000 more per year, forever, if you want to keep going with gas. Because it, it's just destroying the great plains of the US. I mean, fuck market with these gas wells. There are two, over 2.5 million, around 2.5 million active oil and gas wells, another 2 million plus inactive oil and gas wells in the US. And so they're just, they're just growing and growing. So you know, this is an endless destruction of the environment just by the drilling, continuous drilling. They have to do forever. And it's just it's worse and worse. I mean, take up the size of like uh, the state of Maine, all the well pads, the roads, the storage facilities. They're taking up, you know, the state, the state of Maine in the US has already been allocated in an area the size of that state. It's been allocated to oil and gas oil. It's just going to grow. Whereas with wind and solar, you put it in, and that's all you need. And you have a little bit of increase in here, but you don't need to keep mining. You don't need to keep mining to provide the fuel. So the fuel comes too with the wind and solar. And so that's why you stabilize prices. You have zero fuel costs. You're, in fact, you're, you look at the 10 states in the United States with the highest fraction of electricity from wind. Their price over an eight year period, their price of energy in the state declined by 1%. All the other states, the price of energy increased about 8%. So you stabilize energy prices because you have zero fuel costs. And you're going to see this as you start running out of gas, it becomes harder to find things in oil. And those prices are going to go up more and more rapidly. So you might as well transition now because it's eventually going to happen due to this price of uh, the lack of resource that you're eventually going to run out. Mark, thank you so much, sir. You've been very, very helpful.